Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dave's Math Channel. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a very important topic in math, namely the topic of complex numbers. I don't know if you guys are familiar with these, but they're a very important set of numbers. Uh, and uh, how do we define them? Well, we start with this number we call i. i is known as the imaginary unit. And this is the equation that defines i. We say i is the number whose square is equal to negative 1. That might seem a little strange to you because we know that no real number can have a square that's negative. We know that the square of every real number is not negative. Uh, but we can just define a number. Say there's a number called i is not a real number and the square is minus 1. And let's just see what happens if we do that. So uh, you can calculate powers of i. Uh, here's a table of the first few powers of i. These are easy to calculate. I have the zero to one because any number of the zero power is one. Uh, I have the first power is i because any number of the first power is equal to itself. I squared, we already defined to be minus one. I cubed, we can calculate that as i squared times i, but we know that i squared is negative one, so we have negative one times i, which is negative i. I have the fourth, we can calculate as i squared times i squared, uh, which is negative one times negative one, which we know is equal to one. So taking the fourth power gets it back to one. And uh, fifth power, we have i to the fourth times i. And the fourth, we said was one. We get back to i. And you, you can see that if you keep continuing this, you'll get a periodic sequence with a period of four. Every fourth power of i is equal to one. And uh, that's kind of nice. And uh, um, so um, what can we do with these numbers? Well, we can form what we call a, uh, a complex number is just... Uh, a real part. It's a, it's like a two-dimensional analog of the real number. So we start with a real, which we call A. That's just a real number. And then we multiply I, the, the imaginary unit, by another real number, which we call B. So every, every complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. And uh, if you want to think of the complex numbers as a set of numbers, this is kind of a useful picture. This is a Venn diagram showing various sets of numbers. So, uh, and it also kind of goes through the history of uh, how we've looked at numbers over the centuries. If you look at the small red circle on, uh, in the center, that's the natural numbers. Those are just the numbers starting with zero. Sometimes people start with one. one. Uh, but zero, one, two, three, four, sometimes they're called count numbers. Uh, then you have the integers. Those are the ones in orange. Those include negative numbers. Um, uh, the ancients didn't, the ancient Greeks didn't even have zero, and they certainly didn't have negative numbers. Those weren't invented, I think, until the early Renaissance. And then uh, you can keep going. You can find fractions, Q, uh, the yellow uh, oval here. Um, those are known as rational numbers, just ratios of integers. And then you can keep going. You can define uh, irrational numbers, numbers that aren't rational. And uh, there was a Greek guy named Hippasus who actually discovered that the square root of 2 was irrational, and the Greeks were so upset because they didn't believe in irrational numbers. The legend is they drowned them at sea. Tough luck for him. But there are irrational numbers, and every rational number that's not irrational, well, there's there's there's, th there's two types of uh, real numbers, rational and irrational. This isn't a really good picture because everything that's not rational among the real should be irrational. But then uh, you've got another set of numbers I just talked about, complex numbers, and those consist of real numbers, the green stuff, and imaginary numbers, which I just uh, explained. So that's a bigger set of numbers. Uh, anyway, uh, how do we visualize these? Well, there's something called the complex plane. This is also known as an argon diagram. There was a French mathematician in the early 19th century who came up with this pictorial representation of complex numbers. Very nice uh, representation. You can think of a complex number as a vector, a two-dimensional vector. I think most of you guys are familiar with vectors. So you can just think of it as a, as a you know, a, a array starting at the origin, which is known as a vector, and it has a real component and a magic part. We call the real component A and the magic component B. And then we say Z, that's the usual letter we use for complex variables. We say Z is equal to A plus B I. So that's a nice visualization. And uh, you can do a lot with these things. And there's another uh, important representation of complex numbers. The, the representation I just gave you is known as the 
uh, Cartesian or rectangular representation. But just like vectors, there's two ways you can represent two-dimensional vectors. You can either represent them in rectangular coordinates or in polar coordinates. So you can talk about the length or the norm of this uh, complex number, also known as the absolute value. We use the letter R for that. Um, the equation R is a square root of x squared plus y squared. That's just the Pythagorean theorem. And then you got this angle phi, which is the angle from the x-axis to, to the complex number z. And uh, there's a formula for that, too, with the arc tangent of uh, y over x. Uh, but anyway, so you have these two representations of complex numbers. They're both very useful. And uh, actually, yeah, I think one of the most amazing formulas in the history of mathematics, some people think this is the most amazing formula, or two formulas in the history of mathematics. This is known as Euler's formula. When I first saw this formula, I, I, I was just really taken aback. I learned this, I think, my freshman year of college. So here's the formula. It says e to the i phi. E is the base of natural logarithms. So this is, a, this is just an exponential expression. So there's a number called e, which is about 2.718. You raise it to an imaginary power, i times phi. Phi is just a real number. It doesn't have to be real, actually. But uh, here we think of phi as an angle, the angle I just showed you, uh, this angle, phi. And uh, it turns out that e to the i phi uh, is equal to cosine phi plus i sine phi. Pretty amazing formula. What this really means in terms of this picture here is that we can we can also call z, we can write z as r e to the i phi. They don't do it here, but uh, that's another way to write z. So there's two representations of complex numbers, like I said, uh, rectangular, polar, and a nice way to write polar is e to the i phi. And one consequence of Euler's formula is another really amazing formula known as Euler's identity. It's just a special case. Say so you plug in pi for phi. Uh, and when, let's look at this diagram again. What would happen if this angle was pi? Well, pi is 180 degrees. That would put you on the negative x-axis. So that means that if r was 1, e to the uh, i pi is just negative 1. Uh, and another way to say that is e to the i pi plus 1 is 0. And uh, some people think this is the most amazing formula in math because it uses probably the five most important constants in math, e, i, pi, 1, and 0, all in one form. Pretty amazing. You know, I guess you can kind of think of that as a unified field theory of math, if you like. Pretty amazing formula. Um, anyway, uh, here's another diagram of complex numbers. This actually has e to the i phi in it. I should have showed this one instead. But this just says e to the i phi is cosine phi plus i side phi. So this kind of is a visual representation of Euler's formula. Uh, which is a very useful formula, by the way, besides being really amazing. And uh, one last thing I want to mention is what a uh, very important theorem in math known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. Gauss, another very famous mathematician, came up with this theorem, I think, in the early 19th century. What it says is that, uh, basically, it says that you start with any polynomial. And a polynomial is just a, a function uh uh, it's a you know function which is just uh, it's a sum of powers of the variable x. Uh, so uh, you have a to the x n. They don't write down all the coefficients, but you would write a n x to the n a my n minus one x to the n minus one plus a one x plus a zero. Uh, uh, anyway, if that if you take any polynomial, you can factor it. If you you can factor it completely over the complex numbers. That's basically what the fundamental theorem of algebra says. So you can write it two different ways. You can write it as a sum of uh, you know powers of x with coefficients in front of them, or you can write it as a, a product uh, of uh, of um, linear factors. And you might repeat some of these factors, but basically what this says is that every linear polynomial, every polynomial uh, factors completely over the complex numbers. That means that every polynomial of degree n has exactly n roots, n complex roots, may be repeated. Pretty amazing fact, I think. Um, that's not true over the reals, by the way. Uh, the, the polynomial x squared plus 1 does not have any real roots, but it has two imagined roots, uh, i and minus i. Um, so anyway, that's that's my talk on complex numbers. I hope you enjoyed it.
and I'll see you next time.